From shallow water reefs to the mysterious deep, Ocean X is on a mission to explore the ocean and bring it back to the world. Here is an awe-inspiring collection of the groundbreaking discoveries Ocean X has made during its explorations. Last week, myself working on site, Edie Witter caught the first ever footage of a giant squid in US waters, the second time this has been recorded worldwide. So Edie was the first person who ever got footage of a live giant squid in its natural habitat. Myself and Edie, we'd been deploying a deep sea camera called the Medusa out in the Gulf of Mexico. You've got to think that this is one of the largest animals on this planet and we've only seen it live in the wild twice. So we don't really know much about their behavior or their habitats or how they eat, but from these little clips, we can start to piece some of that puzzle together. We've been reviewing around 20-some you know, hours of this footage at this point and hadn't actually seen too much on this deployment. Then all of a sudden, uh, like out of the blue, a giant squid comes out. My mind is immediately blown. I jump up, pretty sure I don't even say anything, I just gotta wave my hand. She can see in the look in my face that I've seen something big. She runs over, we start reviewing the footage, her eyes start to get wide. And then we actually get the whole crew round because this is, I mean, this is a monumentous moment. We hear a huge crack. We all run outside. We see a big plume of black smoke and we realize that lightning has just struck the boat and it's just struck our long range radio antenna, which has exploded. We start wondering like, what, what's this done to the laptop? We haven't backed up this footage at this point. So we run back inside. One of the laptops on the boat had actually been fried, but luckily my laptop was still okay so we kind of mop our brows and kind of try to collect ourselves for a second and the captain actually comes down and warns us that we have a water spout forming out 50 meters off the side of the boat so we see this kind of water tornado cruising down we give it a wide berth <laughs> and then we went on with the day all a little bit stressed but all having the time of our lives We'd been driving for eight and a half hours across this barren, abyssal plain. And I felt incredibly guilty because all of the effort had gone into finding nothing. And something changed in the far distance. It looked a little bit murky, and I remember the seafloor was getting darker. And we were starting to approach the wall from the coastline at that point, and I thought, oh, we must now be at the end of the dive, and we've failed but the image got slightly darker. And then as we got closer, there was little bits of seaweed which have washed down from the shallows, but they were floating just above the seafloor in a really weird way. And then the lights from the ROV cast down and you could see the bow wave from the ROV propagating out across the brine pool. And it was the most beautiful thing. And I remember the first thing I felt was relief. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That's you doing the wave, right? Yeah. Oh, that's really awesome. awesome. Anything that goes in there doesn't move. Yeah, yeah. Are you sure that already is in the water? <laughs> The CTD was the only way that we could get samples of the water back to the surface and also measure the chemical properties of the brine. And we had to have the CTD and the ROV down at the same time because we were using the ROV to see what was going on. And there was a lot of trepidation because they're both tethered to the ship by cables nearly a mile and a half beneath the ship and there's an incredibly high chance that they're going to get tangled and cause the loss of the ROV, the loss of the CTD, or both. So what we did is we lowered the ROV down and rested it on the brine because the brine is so dense. And once we'd got that positioned, we could give the signal visually of when to trigger the water sample. So the first sigh of relief was when the CTD 
appeared in the video coming from the ROV because we knew that it made it down that far without getting tangled. But then to guide it down literally centimeter by centimeter very slowly to make this very precise point and then actually seeing the bottle snap close with the water inside it, it was a huge relief. It was very exciting because I don't think this has ever been done before in such a precise way. There's a lot of life around the brine pool and even within it, and it doesn't seem to be coincidence. It seems that organisms have learnt about the brine and are using it to their advantage. So there were these huge armies of shrimp which live on the rocks looking down into the brine, and it seems that when anything goes into the brine by accident, before the organism dies and sinks to the bottom of the brine pool where it's inaccessible, the shrimp rush in and snatch it from the brine surface and they're using the brine as a trap. The reason why this is so special is that to get this sort of environment you need hydrothermal activity. And if you're going to get hydrothermal activity you need plate tectonics. And if Earth is one of the rare planets which has plate tectonics and that can produce such environments, it's conceivable that life in the universe is very rare indeed. Perhaps we're the only ones. And if we're going to go out into the universe and look for life elsewhere, we're going to be targeting uh, planets or moons like Europa around Jupiter, where we understand there's a hydrothermal circulation, and you might have brine pools very similar to what we're seeing right now. We nearly missed it. I mean, we were close to giving up. And it just goes to show that if you're at the bottom of the sea and you've got 15 minutes left, push on. It's a privilege. Take every single minute and every single second you've got because you never know what's around the corner. One of our primary goals is to establish protected areas in New England's ocean. And what's really exciting about the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts is we're only beginning to discover what's there. When you leave the surface, it's a new world down here. It's a different world. There he is, swordfish. Oh, like just like that. <laughs> a really large billfish came through here just now. These are remarkable places on our planet where life aggregates and comes to be. The Northeast Canyons and Seamounts, it's known as the Serengeti of the Atlantic. It's a biodiversity hotspot. It's home to about 75 different species of deep sea corals. It's truly extraordinary for the wildlife that it supports there. These corals are not like shallow water reef corals you might think about. Deep sea corals don't rely on sunlight at all. Instead of being broad and flat like a reef you might find in the Caribbean, they stand more up like trees and they put themselves out into the current. And because they stand out into the water, animals like to get on them. There's lots of other animals that also want those passive particles that they could feed on. There'll be brittle stars and crabs, shrimp, worms. These corals interact with other animal life in a really weird way. They allow certain animals to get on them and other animals to not get on them. There's communication at a tissue or cellular level that we don't understand yet. And when I think about medical procedures that require acceptance of tissue, I think about the corals. And products from the marine environment that help in medicines. In the process of doing my PhD research, 
I suddenly found myself becoming an adventurer, an explorer. Outside of Misol, there are only about 10 of these jellyfish lakes worldwide. Jellyfish lakes are particularly difficult to get to. These lakes in Misol were formed 20,000 years ago. Their clearly defined barriers allows us to study questions about evolution and speciation. Once we found where the lakes were, we had to search for an entryway. That was definitely not easy. Here, you can pass it to me here. One more. All right. We have all our marine biology equipment, which we have to schlep through the jungle, making certain we also just don't fall and hurt ourselves. You OK there? All right. All right, hold on. But having such a difficult entry just makes the lake even more rewarding. Oh, wow. Beautiful. It kind of looks like it's raining, yeah. but actually those are just the jellyfish bumping against the surface. Oh, wow. We should go swim out to there. In the sea, everything is connected. What's cool about marine lakes is that we have a really clearly defined little bit of sea that's isolated. We can actually get a sense of how species change through time. Marine lakes are giant natural laboratories of evolution. Aside from jellyfish, there are lots of colorful and beautiful sponges. Every time I go to a lake, I find that half the species are new to science. We're seeing the first stages of populations becoming new species. Biodiversity fascinates me. How many species there are, how they're formed, how we can protect them. From a very young age, I was really passionate about the sea. I feel very lucky to do this research. Being a marine biologist, it's just so much fun. During this expedition, we've been able to really merge our traditional way of sampling with a new uh, way of sampling that is brought by the technology of Ocean X. You can see corals. So there has been a lot of mesophotic reef exploration, deep reef exploration done by colleagues in the world, but nobody really had a chance to uh, deploy all these technological assets in the water at the same time to try and discover and tell a story. The most groundbreaking discovery from this expedition has been this very rich mesophotic communities that we've seen in the Gulf of Aqaba. It's gone beyond my hopes. This is new, this is not known, and we have the duty to report it and make it public and make sure that we preserve this, that this goes into management plans and, and, and conservation. There's going to be multiple students and colleagues that are going to benefit from this data. A great amount of information that we've collected that cannot be tackled by an individual. It's going to be multiple projects uh, that are going to unfold, uh, both in the lab and, again, in the field somewhere else to compare the Neom area to other places in the Red Sea. The thing which really excites me about Raja Ampat is the fact that it's still full of mystery. It's still unknown where mantas go to give birth. It's never been documented in the wild. 
the main reason we're doing this is to be able to protect them. We have a baby mantis spotted in the far northwestern lagoon. Now we've got the helicopter up there trying to keep eyes on it. Yeah, we got a mantis right up here on the surface, a baby. See him? Yeah. Okay, right in front of us. As soon as I've got in the water, I'm realizing that this manta is really curious and quite happy to continue feeding around us, barrel rolling right in front of us. You're just blown away by this incredible little baby manta. My heart was definitely beating a little bit, hoping that we could actually manage to get this tag in. It's hard when you're a young girl to think that you could ever get there. But if you're willing and you don't listen to people telling you that you can't do it, you will get there. <laughs>